Take your Bible, Philippians chapter 3 tonight. Philippians 3, we've been in the Bible, we're just going through the Bible in Philippians on Sunday nights, and um, I, I thought about maybe not pursuing this, knowing that the Rochesters would be here this evening, but uh, I feel like it's just where we ought to go. So if you look in your Bible, Philippians chapter 3, this is what we preached last Sunday night, verse number 1, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Now, at the end of the service Sunday, we had somebody to get born again. Isn't that a blessing? And did you know that today while service was going on, we had somebody get born again here this afternoon? How about that? Isn't that a blessing? So, you know, in verse number one, we see that we ought to rejoice in the Lord. The preeminence is placed on rejoicing in God when he says the word finally. He's putting emphasis on that. That's what the book of Philippians has so much to do with. And then he says, my brethren, the people of joy. I believe the only people that really know how to have rejoicing and joy in their heart are people that know God. Now, I think you can know a little bit about happiness and you can have circumstances that make you smile, but wouldn't you agree there's a big difference between having circumstances that make you smile and having a real joy down in your heart? And then he says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. That's the person of joy. I don't know about you tonight. I think we've had some people that just rejoiced in Jesus Christ. And in case somebody happened to be watching by way of live stream and you know, I, I, saw, I saw one of our ladies wave this and I saw one of our men stand up and I saw some hands go up. I think it's right to rejoice in the Lord. You get to thinking about what he did for you and being thankful about what he did for you. It's right to rejoice in the Lord. And I think the next verse is really something that stands in opposition to that and gives a warning there. Look in verse number two. It's the only verse I'm preaching on. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. How many of y'all think verse 2 is negative? Amen. How many of you think verse 1 is really positive? Are y'all not going to be participant at all tonight? <laughs> verse 1, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. That is a positive thing. That is a good thing. And verse 2 is negative because he's trying to warn the believers of Philippi, don't let somebody come and snatch your joy. Amen. You know what? I think, I think we ought to go to heaven, not just saying, well, I'm glad I made it. I think we ought to go to heaven with a joy down in our heart. I understand we have a virus. I understand we have political unrest. We have social unrest. And I don't, I don't enjoy in it, but I'll tell you right now, I want to leave this world with joy down in my heart. I want, listen, I want to end my, listen, I don't know how long God let me stay here. I, I don't know what kind of health I'll have. If I, if I end up retiring, say in my 60s, in my late 60s, if I make it that far, I, I, don't, I don't want to step out with a frown on my face and a sour heart. I want to leave this pulpit with joy in my heart. But I'm telling you right now, you might have that aspiration, but if you're not careful, there's some people that will take that joy from you. And so that's why God says to beware of dogs. Now, I don't think anybody needs any kind of a Greek lexicon to figure out beware of dogs means you better beware of dogs. Amen? Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Now, just by way of introduction, if you could write out beside that, these are people he's telling you to beware of that people can take your joy. He says the same thing in Galatians. Ye did run well. Who hath hindered you? That a person took and changed the direction. And if you'll just write out beside it, this is the, really the outline. Beware of dogs. I believe those are Christless people. You, I, you know, I think one way to help your joy is to stay around people that are in love with Jesus Christ. You get around that kind of people, and you know what? It's easier to have joy, just like tonight. Listen, we're inside of a church building. I'm going to say that the majority of people here are born again, so when somebody gets us to singing about I love Jesus, it makes you want to say amen, me too. So dogs are Christless people. And then evil workers, the only time that that phrase occurs in your Bible is right here. Evil workers, these are corrupt people. 
These are people that you find in Proverbs chapter 1 that say, come with us, cast your purse in with us. Let us, and listen, he says, my son, when sinners entice thee, consent thou not. You know, you get around some things that are corrupt, it just kind of spreads. It, it's amazing to me how you can have really nice, fresh, I mean, enjoyable fruit in a crisper and find out only a couple days later that there was a rotten thing in the bottom of it and it has spread to all that other fruit where you just about have to dump it all out. We had fig tree in Alabama and I, I, I enjoy eating figs. I, I was told that figs are brain food, so I, I started eating them for help that way but found out that really didn't help a whole lot. But I enjoy figs. I enjoy fig preserves. And we would pick a great big bowl of figs and we, oh, we, listen, we loved them. But you know, if you let that sit down in the bottom, if you've got a fig that's got a problem, it's going to ruin that whole bowl of figs. That's why the Bible says that we're to beware of that leaven because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And you and I, we don't need to be around corrupt people. You're saying you, we can't be around sinners. Oh, no. You're, you're in company tonight of sinners that have been saved by the grace of God. You just need to be careful about being around corrupt people. And then lastly, lastly, he says in verse number two, beware of the concision. Now, that's a word, and I'm not going to spend the time tonight to do it, but there's a lot that I can say about concision. Concision has to do with cutting, all right? Circumcision, you find that in the very next verse, for we are the circumcision. But in verse number two, you have the word concision. The only time it occurs in the Bible, very difficult to define what it is. But I will say this, concision has to do with cutting. So if you need to be careful of Christless people and you need to be careful of corrupt people, I'm telling you who else you need to be careful of. You need to be careful of cutting people. You get around people that always have sharp words and always have something negative to say. They always find fault in something. If you want to lose your joy, you hang around somebody like that, you know what you're going to find out? You're not going to be as happy as they are. You're going to end up being unhappy like they are. Amen. Cutting people. I like to, I, listen, I like to be around joyful people. I like to I like be around people who have an excellent spirit. I like to be around people that, listen, you don't have to be, uh, listen, you don't have to ha be one of those people that finds the silver lining in every cloud, but I tell you what you ought to be, you ought to be somebody that can be thankful, like we sang at, we, as we ended. You ought to be able to find something to be thankful for. Amen. Amen. You need to be careful of cutting people. Now, saying that, I want you to take and put a mark there in Philippians 3 and go to Psalm 59. All three of these are sort of put together in Psalm 59. And then I'm going to get to preaching on that very first point. Psalm 59. This psalm is said to be written when Saul sent and they watched the house to kill David. So Saul is looking to take David's life and this psalm is written on that occasion. Now, whether that's true or not, I, I don't know. That's just what is, is, is stated. But if you look what the Bible says in verse number two, deliver me from the workers of iniquity. All right, there are your evil workers. And save me from bloody men. And he goes on to say, for lo, they lie and wait for my soul. The mighty are gathered against me, not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord. They're not gathered against me for something I've done wrong. They've gathered against me because they're my enemy. Keep going. If you look down at verse number uh, five, thou therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, wake to visit all the heathen. Be not merciful to any wicked transgressors. Selah, they return at evening. They make a noise like a dog. And they go round about the city. There's your dogs right there. Behold, they belch out with their mouth. Swords are in their lips. There's your concision. For who say they doth hear? And really what you're seeing, what I'm trying to get you to see is in this psalm, David is speaking about the same people that are threatening him. And in Philippians, it's being spoken about people that will take your joy, Christless people, corrupt people, cutting people. But that first phrase, and if you'll stay right there in Psalm 59, beware of dogs. Now, I've heard people preach all kinds of messages about dogs and everything else, and and um, I'm not trying to upset anybody tonight if you uh, love your dog, all right? Look, I, look, I know there are, there, there are hunting dogs that are valuable. There are some hunting dogs that are worth more than some people's vehicles. 
If I had a dog worth more than my vehicle, I'd sell my dog. <laughs> I'd get a nicer vehicle. You have service dogs. You have dogs that are made to be a service and a help to people that have needs. You have all kind of dogs that guard things, guard dogs. Then you have dogs that take and they herd. They're herd dogs. They take and they, they move the sheep and the, the cattle along, Australian shepherds and whatnot. You have wild dogs, dogs that are, that are not tame, that are not put in the same picture that we would the dogs we have. Then, you know, there are other dogs. There are lap dogs. I, I wish I didn't know what a lap dog is, but unfortunately, I believe I've got one in my house. You say, what's a lap dog? It's a dog so little it can sit in your lap. That's what it is. It doesn't hunt. It doesn't serve. It doesn't guard. It doesn't herd. It just sits. <laughs> and I want you to understand tonight, when he says beware of dogs, I think that there's a lot in the Bible about dogs that we could learn. And you've got to be careful that people don't take your joy. In fact, the Bible says there in verse number 14, at evening, let them return and let them make a noise like a dog, barking, howling, going round about the city. He's speaking about that. And in the Bible, a dog is very different from what you and I would normally put into our mind about dogs. We have very much so domesticated dogs and we have made dogs part of our homes now. In fact, I'm just curious, again, how many of you Remember a time when there were no dogs allowed in the house. Can I see a hand? Has anybody got like that? All right. How many of you remember a time when there were no dogs allowed, sometimes even on the porch? Do you remember that? Not, not as many. The porch was for people to sit on, not the dog to sit on. He was supposed to be out in the yard, and that's very different from what we believe today. Dogs are wild in the Bible. There's something that belongs outside. Look at verse 6. They return at evening. They make a noise like a dog and go round about the city. They're outside the city. They're outside the house. They're wild. They have no master. They're not something you're walking around with a leash on. There's something that has no control or no one that has authority over them. All right, that's what a dog, and then not only are they wild, but look at verse number 15, let them wander up and down for meat. They're wandering in the Bible. In fact, when they wander for meat, we won't spend time to do it, but in 1 Kings 14, 16, and 21, the Bible speaks about dogs feeding on carcasses. In other words, somebody is killed and the dogs aren't kept in a pen and fed a scoop of dog food, those dogs are roaming wild and they go and find what they can to eat. I've got some of those dogs in my neighborhood. They're roaming looking for something to eat. And then not only are dogs wandering and wild, but also look at verse number seven, they're wretched. Behold, they belch out with their mouths. <laughs> you know, I, I really don't think that we ought to, um, I think we ought to be careful about being mannerly. Uh, there are words that I don't use in the pulpit because I don't want to cheapen the pulpit. There are things that I don't do around other people because I, I don't want to be crude or crass or rude. I understand in the Middle East when you finish a meal, and since we didn't get to go to Israel, I didn't get to test it out, but I understand when you finish a meal in the Middle East that you're supposed to belch very loud if it was good. I don't know which would be worse, bad food or a table full of people belching at one time. It's just crude. It's nasty. And you know dogs in the Bible are nasty? Dogs eat their own vomit. That's nasty. That's wretched. And all I'm saying is in the Bible, when you begin looking dogs, wild, wandering, wretched, but also if you look in verse 7, this is something that I want you to get, and this is what I mentioned a minute ago, Christless people. Look at verse 7. Behold, they belch out with their mouth. Swords are in their lips, biting, snarling, showing their teeth. Yeah, I, I still to this day don't know whether to believe people that say if a dog is wagging his tail, it's all right or not. Have you ever heard the conflict? Yeah, if the dog wags his tail, he won't bite you. I, I don't believe it's true. <laughs> and all I'm saying is that a dog, a dog has teeth, and this has swords in their lips. And so in, just like in Jeremiah 15, that dogs tear, biting, snarling. And all I'm saying is we're being told there's a, so much in the Bible about dogs. 
And if you go back to Philippians 3 and put a mark, keep a mark right there in Psalm 59, I want you to read it again. Verse 1, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. I want you to keep your joy, Philippian jailer. I want you to keep your joy, Lydia, seller of purple. I want you to keep your joy, ma'am, that had the devil in you that was cast out. I want you to keep your joy, and to do that, you need to beware of dogs. You need to beware of dogs. Now, dogs certainly, dogs certainly in the Bible, the Gentiles are called dogs. And you can see that in Matthew 7. Mark chapter 7, Matthew 15, you can see it in the book of Isaiah. They're called dogs. But I really don't think that that's what, don't think that's what the writer is, is intending here. I don't think this is being written to Gentiles in Philippi to beware of other Gentiles. In fact, I'd like to say this tonight. I'm glad, I'm glad that now we don't use a term dogs. Jesus told, listen, when Peter went and looked at that vision, that thing came th times, three times down. You know what the Lord told him? He said, call not thou common what I have made clean. Aren't you glad I'm not, you're not a Gentile dog anymore. You're part of the body of Christ. You're part of the family of God. Now, the Jews and the Gentiles, both alike, didn't have any love for one another, and definitely the word dog was used, but I really don't believe that's what that means here. I, in fact, I've just got two points that I'm going to give you. What is a dog that you need to beware of? Christless people. You need to beware of Christless people, and I want to show you what I mean by that. If you're in Psalm 59, turn back a few pages to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Again, it's amazing how much the Bible says about dogs and what you can find out about what its meaning is. So if I'm supposed to be aware of dogs, I'm supposed to run from a dog. By the way, has anybody here ever run from a dog? You ever run from a dog? <laughs> you ever walked up to a house that had a chain underneath the steps and decided whether or not you needed to go up there or not? You ever done that? You ever seen a sign on somebody's fence that says, beware of dog? and just felt led of the Lord to go maybe to the next house? Because I'm looking. I'm look, I, I can vividly remember. We were in, we in St. Lucia. St. Lucia. We're going door to door, inviting people out to the meeting. And um, I think I was one of the men in our church. And the dogs there, they definitely don't keep them in pens. They don't keep them on chains. They do. They wander. They feed because their society doesn't have the money to be able to sustain sometimes a family and all these other pets at the same time. So they're just wandering around. Well, we went out there, and, and when we got out there, we, we, we went to this one house, and as we came through, I heard the awfulest barking you've ever heard in your life. I mean, snarling, rah, 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 and, the, and the, the grass started moving. I could see it was moving our direction. I thought, well, this is a bad, this is a bad thing. And that, a dog came, I, this is the only time it's ever happened to me. Dog came out, and this dog, the, the hair on its back was sticking up. You ever seen that before? Hair on the back of that dog was sticking up, and he started digging on the ground. And he is, I mean, showing teeth. And we're saying, hey! <laughs> We're hoping somebody would come out, you know, and, and, and so he starts moving closer. And you can believe this or not, doesn't really matter to me, it happened, I was there. I, all I had with me were flyers and tracks. And so as he started getting closer, I just put out the track into the dog. <laughs> you say, what did he do? He stopped. And then of all things, the lady of the house said, oh, he won't bite you. You come on out here and just go and prove that. <laughs> You know, I tell you right now, if I, if I went back out visiting, I would note that house because I'm going to lose my joy at that house. I'm going to have something to take a bite out of me. And listen, church, you don't need to give up your joy. I believe one of the things that makes us who we are and identifies us is we've got the joy of Jesus Christ in our heart. Amen. The fruit of the Spirit, one of those is joy on the inside. And if you look what it says in Psalm 22 to identify that, Psalm 22, that Psalm 22, um, your Bible takes in Psalm 22, this is a messianic psalm. It's pictured of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 14, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart 
is melted like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. Now, I want you to underline, if you would, right there in verse 16, the assembly of the wicked. In verse 16, this is a picture of Christ at Calvary and those people that are there at Calvary, he is describing them as dogs. All right, these are the people that are spitting at Jesus. These are the people that are calling for his blood and mocking him. These are the people that smote him with their hands. These are the people that are enemies of Jesus Christ. And I'll, I'm just going to tell you, are you listening to me? You need to stay away from people that are at enmity with Jesus Christ or they'll take your joy. Come on now, I, I know I'm in the South. Listen, when somebody starts talking about mama, you're going to get fired up, aren't you? You get to talk about my mother, you get to talk about my dad, I'm going to get fired up about it. And these people right here, they have a hatred for Jesus Christ. They, they, have, a, they have a disdain for him. And he calls, the Bible calls them dogs, but it says the assembly of the wicked. Amen. You understand at the cross of Calvary, Jesus' disciples had fled. His mother is there. And John is there, and some of the women are there. Praise God for the women that will stand by the cross. But everybody else is scattered. And now they find themselves in the assembly of the wicked. And I'm going to tell you, enemies of Jesus Christ. Now, this, this may, be, may be a little bit uh, application instead of necessarily interpretation, but I'm, there's some assemblies of the wicked you don't need to be a part of. I think you ought to be part of the assembly of God and being here with the body of Christ. I think you ought to gather together when the church gathers together. Can I get an amen right there? Amen. But there's some assemblies you don't need to be a part of. You say like what? Like a bar or a club or a party. You don't have any business being there. Because you get there, you're going to find out you're going to be around Christless people. Jesus isn't welcome at most bars. Jesus isn't welcome at most parties. That's why, in my opinion, even though we're way far away from it, that's why it, oh, when you have spring break and all these people go down to the beach at spring break and have all the drinking and all the, all the music and all that stuff, you know what, as a Christian, you young people listening to me, you don't belong in a place like that. You don't belong in a place like that. When they have a prom and people are drinking and doing all that, you don't belong in a place where the wicked have assembled together. You need to stay away from those kind of places. Or you'll lose your joy. You might lose more than that. I think you ought to stay away from casinos. <laughs> I don't think you ought to play the lottery. Right. Well, we just going to have fun in Las Vegas, preacher. You know, in Las Vegas, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. You might leave some things behind in Vegas like your joy. Oh, no, we're just going to have a good time. Well, you lose four or $5,000, you won't have as much joy, that's for sure. It bothers me that people won't be part of riots today. I tell you what, I... The news can't even go up very close to some of the people riding in our country because of the filthy language coming out that they got to stop and bleep out. As a Christian, you don't have any business being part of that. You need to be careful about joining up to that crowd. I think you need to be careful about being part of, of uh, worldly music and concerts and all that. I don't think you need to have any, you ought not have no part going to anything that's got all kind of wild music in it, music that is sensual and sinful. I don't think you belong there. You say, that's personal preaching. I think it's practical preaching because you end up in a place like that, you're going to lose the joy of Christ you had in your heart. Oh, I got born again. Man, I'm so glad I'm saved, but now I'm going down here to the rock concert. There are people drinking beer, and boy, there are all, all kind of things going on. You ought not to have anything to do with that, Christian. Lose your joy. I don't think you need to be involved in any kind of a 
religious festival. Oh, it's such a beautiful thing that the Hindu people do and they throw all the different colors up in the air and we just want to be a part of it. I don't want to have anything to do with anybody worshiping another God. There's only one God and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to worship him and nobody else. What do you think to do with that? You need to be careful about being in the assembly of the wicked. Now, I, I know that that's something that maybe it sounds like, boy, preacher, that seems like hard. That's not hard. You'll lose your joy there. Put a mark in Psalm 22 and go, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 1. The wisest man ever to live. I mentioned it a moment ago. Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs 1, verse number 10. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us. Let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as thou go down to the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. I'm telling you right now, there's some people you don't need to join up with. There's some people you don't need to get in the car with. I went to a Christian school and I didn't have any more Christianity than this pulpit has in it. And uh, I think I've told the story before. We had some friends of mine that had this bright idea that we were going to jump a train. Come on, we're going to have fun. You know what's not fun? To jump off a moving train. It's not fun to make a phone call where your clothes all torn up saying, hey, could you come and pick me up? It's not fun. I'm telling you right now, listen, you young people and, and all of us, there are people that are your friend as long as things are going well, but as soon as they go poorly, they are not going to be around. They're not going to come get you out of jail. They're not going to come help you. That's your thing you've got to live with. And I just tell you, you're the best thing to do. Stay out of the assembly of the wicked with Christless people and stay in the assembly where the Bible-believing people are. That's the best choice you can make right there. Amen. Amen. It'll help you have your joy. Now, some of y'all look like, like I'm hurting your joy. I hope I'm not hurting your joy. I tell you right now, though, if you think it's all right for people to go down and take off all their clothes, listen to a bunch of music on the beach and drink beer, I'm telling you right now, that's not my crowd. That's not my crowd. I don't want to be in the middle of that. I want to be in the middle of a bunch of people that believe the Bible is the Word of God. I want to be around a bunch of people that are singing about Jesus Christ. That's where I want to be. I want to be where people are willing to raise their hand and say, I do, I do worship the God of heaven. That's my crowd. Yes. Amen. Amen. That's my crowd. You get in that other crowd, they'll take your joy just as sure as you're alive. They'll, they'll take your joy. Amen. There won't be a joy there. There'll be a duality that's just not real. The enemies of Christ. We'll go to Isaiah 56, would you? Isaiah 56. Are you still with me? Now, the Holy Ghost is trying to say, look, I want you to stay joyful, so you've got to be careful of Christless people, corrupt people, cutting people. Isaiah 56. Isaiah 56, again, speaking of dogs, again, the Bible just has so much to say about that. And if you look here what the Bible says in verse number 9, all ye beasts of the field come to devour, yea, all ye beasts in the forest. Isaiah 56, 10, his watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleep. Well, there's sometimes I wish that was true of the dogs we have, Amen sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs, which can never have enough, and they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, everyone for his own gain from, from his quarter. Come ye, say they, I will fetch wine, and we will fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow shall be as this day and much more abundant. Now, I, I believe when it says his watchman, and it mentions the word shepherds in verse number 11, I believe with all my heart that these are false prophets, false teachers. Put a mark in Isaiah 56 and go, if you would, to 2 Peter just a moment. 2 Peter. Now, I'm, I'm just trying to give you what's in the Bible. When God says, beware of dogs, we ought to pay attention to that. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 1. 2 Peter 2, 1. The Bible says, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, 
even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So these people bring in heresy. These false prophets, these false teachers, they bring in heresy. Look at verse number three. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. In other words, they're going to say something to you for their benefit because they want you to buy into what they're selling. They want to make merchandise out of you. There's a whole lot we could say about that, but for time, I'm going to keep moving on. Verse number 19, while they promised them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption, for whom a man is overcome of the same he is brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn to the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. In other words, in 2 Peter chapter 2, a false prophet, a false teacher, speaking religious terms to try to get people to buy in to what he's selling, really is promising liberty in verse 19, but he doesn't have liberty. What he has is the same thing that a dog has, and that is a propensity to go back and eat his own vomit. Now, you, listen, you stay with me, church. Stay with me. Listen to me. There are men, there are men that will take and for profit, they will feed you something that sounds religious, but they don't care anything about your soul or about what the Bible has to say. They're going to say whatever will promote them and get them to a place where they can get something from you. They're going to make it to where it sounds like they look so good. Listen, and I'm not going to name names, and I'm telling you right now, listen, if a guy doesn't preach from the Bible, you shouldn't be paying any attention to that man. If a man doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you shouldn't pay attention to that man. If a man doesn't believe that all that's necessary for salvation is the finished work of Jesus Christ, you don't need anything with that individual. Amen. False teaching. Boy, we got them today. We got guys today that, pro here's what they're saying. We've been set free and man, I got saved and now I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go right back to the same world that I used to live in. I'm going to go back out there and do what I used to do. But let me say to you tonight, church, listen, if you follow a man that says he got liberated from his sin by Jesus Christ, but now he wants to be liberated from following the Bible, that is a man that you don't need to listen to. I got a phrase I want to give you. I've heard it recently. There are people, some that used to be in our movement, some that used to be Bible-believing people. They are theologically conservative, but culturally liberal. That means that I can one hand hold a Bible and say I believe in the virgin birth and I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in the other hand, I can hold me a nice glass of Bordeaux or Chateau Bardonnay and I can say, you know what? I'm still just in the same place. I've got liberty because I've been set free. I'm going to tell you right now, somebody that says they're theologically conservative and culturally liberal is somebody you don't need to listen to. Somebody that would lead you back to the bar, somebody that would lead you back to all the places you used to go and tell you that if we preach against it, that's legalism. I'm going to tell you what that is. That's somebody that's giving you false doctrine. I don't want to go back to the world. Amen. Amen. You'd beware of dogs. You'd beware of somebody that's a false preacher of the word of God. In fact, go back to Isaiah 59. It gets pretty bad right here now. And I, I, I didn't write the Bible, but I'm going to preach it. Isaiah 50, 50, excuse me, Isaiah 56. Look at verse number 10. Look what the Bible says. It's amazing to me now. The Bible says that his watchmen are blind. They're sightless. They can't see. A dog that can't see. I'm going to tell you what, when you get your eyes off this book and you don't have an authority, you can't see anymore. When it's just up to you on everything that you do, every standard is up to you, every rule is up to you, I'm glad I've got a book that tells me how to live. Amen. Amen. They're sightless. And look what else it says about these, these false prophets in verse 10. They are all ignorant. So if you're alliterating, you know what word has to go there. They're stupid. Amen. You know why they're ignorant? Because they don't have the Bible anymore. 
I, I, t- I am, I am, listen, oh, I am so disappointed in people that used to preach that God gave us his word, inspired and preserved, but now have changed their mind and talk about how that all we are is a bunch of Bible worshipers. No, the Bible says that thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. I don't worship a Bible, but I tell you what I do. I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible to be correct. I don't need somebody to correct my Bible, to change my Bible. I think it is exactly what God wanted me to have. And if you, listen, when you turn from the Bible, it's going to make you ignorant. Can I get another amen there? I didn't use the word stupid then. They're all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. (laughs) I said a minute ago, I wish that would happen to mine. We we have, listen, we have dogs. We have dogs that bark every time something or someone comes into our yard. Every time the doorbell, if if I really want to upset my family, I go to the door and I ring the doorbell seven times. And they go, my my dogs, not my dogs, their dogs bark when the, listen, if if we're watching television, watching a football game and in a commercial, you know, they're delivering pizza and it goes, ding, dong, and those dogs start barking. They bark after you get in the house. You say, you sound bitter. I am bitter. <laughs> these, these dogs, though, are silent. Oh, you, there are people right now that make fun of what I've said. I've already told you it's not good for you to go to the beach during spring break, during spring break and be down there with all those people drinking all that wild music. They'd say that's a bunch of legalism. You know what I'd say? A dog that can't bark, preachers that wouldn't warn you about sin are not somebody you need to be listening to. Somebody that wouldn't warn you and tell you the truth is somebody you don't need to listen to. They'll take your joy. They'll promise you liberty, but they're going to take your joy. That's like going to a doctor that always tells you that you're all perfectly healthy and there's nothing that's wrong with you. That's not true. Look what else it says about them in verse number 10. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Sound like a lazy dog to me. Sleeping dogs. Verse number 11, yea, they are greedy dogs. They're subtle. They're greedy dogs which can never have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, everyone for his own gain from his quarter. Church, I know you may not believe what I'm saying or understand it all, but there are people that claim to be Christian, claim to be people that have been set free by God that would make merchandise out of you for their own gain. They're not in it for his sake or for your sake. And tonight, honestly, I'm not upset at anybody. I'm just preaching the next verse. I love you enough to tell you exactly what the Bible has to say. Amen. I don't want you to make the same mistakes that I made. A, you know what a good parent, a good parent is a parent that don't want their children to make the same mistakes that they made. You want to be an honest parent. And all I'm saying is that, that here, these are, they, they, they have gain at their heart. Then look at verse number 12. Come ye, say they, I will fetch wine and we will fill ourselves with strong drink. Amen. And tomorrow shall be as this day and much more abundant. Boy, we're going we're gonna to get us some wine and we're going to fill ourselves with it. And this day is going to be like the next day and much more abundant. And it's just going to be good. And that is a lie from the pit of hell itself. Amen. I'm telling you tonight, church, Christless people, I don't care if they've got a television program, a radio program, a church of 5,000 or 50,000. Christless people will rob you of your joy. You know, I remember, I remember when I first came here, I was kind of, you know, I, I looked and I, I saw New Spring when I was driving from um, West Union to come to work. I'd never heard of it. And then when we moved over to Easley, then I saw New Spring there. And then I got to, well, what is this place? And then I began looking and I found out, okay, now I know what this place is. And I, I looked at their worship service and the different things that they say that they do and, and, and really just so much that has so little to do with a holy God and a holy Bible. Amen. But you know, what I, you know what I learned from it? I learned that the pastor got up and he would basically say it's all right to socially drink and 
you guys, it's okay. There's no problem with socially drinking. It's all right. It's fine. Only to come up months later and have to resign because of his drinking problem. How many of you think if you've got a drinking problem, you're going to lose your joy? How many of you think if you've got a drinking problem and you bring it into your home and you lose your marriage, you're going to lose your joy? What I'm saying tonight is this, very simply, Christless people. Amen. You need to beware of being part of what they are. People that are enemies of Christ and people that have a false message. You need to beware. That's why I think you need to read your Bible. That's why you need to be in a Bible-believing church. Amen. I can hear somebody saying, you just want them to come so they can get money. We hadn't passed the plate since March. I think people ought to be in church so they can get something from God. Amen. You need to keep your joy. Don't give it up. Don't let somebody take it from you. And if you listen to them and they guide you down a path and they can't see, they're blind and they won't warn, they're silent. And they take in for their own personal gain. They shift the truth. They're going to take your joy from you. And you don't want that. You, listen, we ought to be the most joyful people on the planet. Amen. Come on now. We ought to be the most joyful people on the planet. Amen. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Shouldn't we be doing that? Amen. 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 Then don't let somebody come and take it. Joy snatcher. Cutting people, corrupt people, Christless people. Don't let them take your joy. Keep it. Keep your joy. I'm looking tonight to see how many of you got, you got am I got any joy in your heart? Well, let's try this. Look at, look at somebody next to you and say, boy, I just, I got a whole lot of joy in my heart. Can you do that? Can you be honest? Let's just see. I, how, let's try this way. I'm, okay, wow, I'm just looking. Some of y'all, that's not working for you, is it? Kind of hard to fight on the way to church and tell somebody you got joy in your heart, isn't it? Won't you look at somebody else and say, hey, I love Jesus Christ. Can you do that? Do you do that? Can you look at somebody next to you and say, hey, I, I love you. Can you do that? There are more people looking at each other saying, I love you. How about that? That's good. Now, you know, here's something. Listen, tonight we had great music tonight. Wasn't it a blessing to hear the Rochester sing? Amen. I sat back there and I knew what I was preaching. Beware of the hogs. And that music was just washing over my soul. At the end of service today, when I was introduced to a man that got saved right over there, joy just washing over my soul. I gathered together with men at 5.15 this afternoon. We started praying, joy just washing over my soul. And you know what? I'm happy to be here tonight. Not because I'm preaching. I'm just happy to be here tonight because this is my crowd. God's given me something I don't want to trade with anybody else. God's given me something I don't want to give away. And you know what? I want my children to have it. I don't want my children to say, well, I'm an independent Baptist and I, I, you know, I carry the right Bible. No, I want it to be more than a form. I don't want my kids to have a form. I want them to have real joy on the inside. And then I want them to look at somebody and say, no, you can't have it. I'm keeping what I got. I'm not getting in the car with you. I'm not going over there to that. I'm not going to listen to that. And that joy just remains. I believe that's what God wants us to be. He wants us to be a joyful people. And Satan wants to take and rip every fiber of joy you have out of your soul and let you be a sour, hurt, bitter Christian all your days. You know what I say? Beware of dogs. Amen. Beware of dogs. Amen. Amen. 